Welcome to the 13th lecture of, for Church History Online. For those of you who are my online students, there are things I can't do with you in this lecture that I can do with the students I have in person in class. We have much more time. In class, we take out our Bibles and evaluate the teachings of the Pentecostals and Charismatics, but I have made available for you uh, the, a downloadable version of the entire class notes for the course. So make sure that you go to them and you'll have a lot of the things that I would have covered in class. We're looking at the Pentecostals today. And when you think of Pe the Pentecostal movement, you first probably think of speaking in tongues. John Sherrill was one of the early def charismatic defenders of the charismatic movement. He wrote a book in the 70s called They Speak With Other Tongues. And he tried to prove that people have spoken with tongues throughout church history, but few scholars would agree. For instance, he claimed that the Montanists, which was a group in the 200s, were Pentecostals and spoke in tongues. Now, now, to their credit, they were rising up against the increased formalism, the coldness that had come into the church, and they were open to the movement of the Spirit, but there's no evidence, no, no record at all that they spoke in tongues. He claimed in his book that Wesley's crowd spoke in tongues, which they did not, that there was tongue speaking in the camp meetings in the first part of the 1800s. That did not happen. In fact, from the first century until 1901, 1902, when the Pentecostal movement exploded, the only group that I can find that spoke in tongues was the Mormons. Um, Joseph Smith talks about this in uh, his Joseph Smith's history of his church. He said, about the 8th of November, I received a visit from elders Joseph Young, Brigham Young, and Haber Kim Kimball. They spent four or five days at Kirtland, during which we had many interesting moments. At one of our interviews, Brother Brigham Young and John Green spoke in tongues, which was the first time I'd ever heard the gift among the brethren. Also, others also spoke, and I received the gift myself. So you have basically from the Bible times till 1901, without any strong evidence of people speaking in tongues, except for people like the Mormons. So where did it come from? Where do you trace the, the, the Pentecostal movement? Well, I believe that you can basically draw a line to today's Pentecostal movement to the person named John Wesley. John Wesley was not a Pentecostal. He did not speak in tongues, but he made a big emphasis on holiness. He would often say that he believed the reason why God raised up the Methodist movement, the Methodist revival, was, quote, to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. He uh, believed that you ought to hold holiness standards. He believed it was sinful for women to wear nice dresses and wear jewels. He believed it would be sinful to take money that could be spent on the poor and use it to do something as worldly as go to a play. So he had some legalistic things that he attached to holiness. But he also taught that there was a possibility out there for a second blessing. He called it entire sanctification. That yes, you get saved at one point, but there was a possibility later on you could have a second experience with God that would lift you above sin, lift you to a higher level of intimacy with God. Now to his credit, even though he taught that this was a possibility, he said that he never experienced it himself and his wife would have agreed. Uh, if you go back and listen to the Wesley uh, lesson that we did. Now, what happened as the Methodists grew and prospered? There's a bootstrap effect that happens when God works among a people. Uh, Wesley and Whitfield were winning people from the poorer classes to Christ, people where alcoholism had been a part. When you get saved and you stop drinking, you can start thinking about doing things like saving for a house. You can become more responsible in a job. You can provide better for your children. So this bootstrap effect, uh, bootstrap of, uh, effect began to happen among the Methodists. So by the time you get to the middle of the 1800s, this emphasis on holiness and sacrifice and even this second blessing were, were basically ignored by the majority of Methodists. And some began to say, we have left one of our founding principles. So in, not, in 1867, the National Holiness Association, Association was formed by people basically who had come from the Methodist background. From that, some new denominations were formed, the Church of the Nazarenes. They were Methodists before they formed this group, which emphasized a second blessing and holiness standards. Uh, A.B. Simpson would later on in that century form the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Uh, 
Bill, Bill Gaither belongs to a church called the Church of God Anderson in Indiana. Not the Cleveland group that you have here that's Pentecostal. This is a non-tongue speaking group that emphasized uh, holiness standards and a second blessing. But what also happened in the 1800s? Many of the people I love dearly, the, my heroes of the faith, embraced teaching people that there was a second experience out there. They called it the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That once you receive that second encounter with God, uh, this incredible experience with the Holy Spirit, it gave you power. It lifted you up to out of sins that were keeping you down. Uh, it was a, it was quite a tremendous emphasis. Uh, that was D.L. Moody taught that. His uh, main person he mentored, R.A. Torrey, taught that. A Baptist preacher named A.J. Gordon taught that there's that second blessing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you can have. Uh, you've got A.B. Simpson of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Now, while many experienced this second blessing, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is what began to happen. As you began to put time between the emotions that happen with this fresh encounter of being filled with the Holy Spirit, as time goes on, many of the things that you thought would always be there, the glow, the power, the sense of the presence of God would begin to wane. So there were a lot of people who began to think, I got the second blessing, but is there something else out there? Now, can I chase that rabbit just a little bit? I don't believe the Bible teaches that there are two phases of salvation and that once you reach this phase, you've arrived because I believe we Christians never arrive. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ also has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and press, reaching forward to the, the, those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When Paul wrote those words, folks, he was near the end of his life. He was in prison at Rome. He'd followed Christ a long time and said, I haven't arrived. I'm still straining toward it. And if, that, if there were an experience, as the Pentecostals and, and Charismatics t tend to say, that gave you this power that lifts you above sin, that makes God become real to you, the Bible become open, here's my observation. You can take it or leave it after watching this for nearly 50 years. I believe that we probably see more immorality that befalls Pentecostal and charismatic preachers than you see in other brands of Christianity. We see divorces happening with almost no repercussions. For instance, I don't know if you know this, but there was a picture taken of Benny Hinn and Paula White holding hands coming out of a hotel in Paris. It didn't affect either one of their ministries. They just basically pretended like it didn't happen. You've got uh, Jimmy Swaggart with his prostitutes, Jim Baker with all of his immorality and, and his mishandling of money. Oral Roberts' son, Richard Roberts, I used to watch their program. He used to sing with his wife, Patty. It was about a three-month period of time where Patty wasn't on the program. All of a sudden, he had a new wife. And, and it wasn't even a pause. It was just like, this is just what happens. It's acceptable. Well, where do we get the Pentecostal movement that we see today that not only emphasizes a baptism in the Holy Spirit with speak, but added speaking in tongues? Well, we can trace the Pentecostal movement to two main events. The first event was a watch night service of December 31st, 1900. Now, technically, a new century begins on the first day of the 01. So this was the beginning of a new century. Charles Parham had formed a holiness Bible college. He had been teaching that you need the second blessing, that you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But as he and his students were going to gather together for a watch night service, to pray through the night for the new year to come, they began to say, you know, we'll have to be honest. We thought we had the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but there's still something that we haven't gotten. We're not experiencing the power. We're not experiencing the victory that, that was promised us with this second. What did we miss out on? So what they decided was to go separately, all the students of the Bible college, to go separately and through the night to seek God, come back in the morning and say, what did God show you that we are missing? When they came back, 
Several of them had read the book of Acts and said, we saw what we're missing. We really hadn't had the baptism of the Holy Spirit because in the book of Acts, when they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. So they stopped right there and they sought that God would give them the real baptism of the Holy Spirit with tongues. The first person to speak in tongues was a woman named Agnes Osmond. And by the way, the Pentecostals have always allowed women to have leading roles in preaching and in leading in their churches. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a church that's a charismatic or Pentecostal church that will have both a husband and wife are both designated as pastors. Well, after this happened he soon closed that school in Kansas and opened another one in Houston Texas now Houston Texas is down in the south one of his students was a one-eyed black man named William Seymour who could not even walk in the classroom because he was black so Parham allowed him to sit outside the door of the classroom and listen in so Parham was teaching this new experience that the real power comes. You really get the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you speak in tongues. And Seymour got excited. He felt like that was it. And he decided that he would return to Los Angeles, his hometown, and preach this new truth. So he rented an old dilapidated building on Azusa Street. They said they were afraid, with as happy as people got later on, that the floor might collapse because it was that run down a building. But he began to preach about this new experience, baptism in the Holy Spirit, with speaking in tongues. But he also, at the same time, began to have a word of prophecy. He kept saying, God is about to shake the earth. God is about to shake the earth. Well, shortly after that, 1906, the earth got shook. The San Francisco earthquake occurred. And that caused notoriety to come to this meeting. Here's this preacher with these newfangled ideas, and he's been predicting an earthquake. And so what happened was this. There was already a longing in America to experience a revival like what had just happened in Wales a year or so before. The Spirit of God had swept through Wales and changed a nation. And people were saying, God, would you do that here? Is there going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? So when all of a sudden crowds began to sw uh, swell in on this meeting because of that prophecy and those new experiences, people began to say, is this it? So people came from all over America. They came, they received that experience. They were excited about returning with that. Now, many of them had come from more Wesleyan holiness backgrounds, uh, churches like the Church of God in Christ or uh, the Church of God Cleveland, Tennessee. Uh, but there were also a Baptist group that embraced it and they formed what today is the largest Pentecostal denomination in the, in the United States, the Assemblies of God. So out of Wesleyan background, out of Baptist background, came different denominations that came from Azusa Street and spread throughout the country. One of the breakoffs of the Assemblies of God, by the way, is a group that has been nicknamed the Jesus Only Pentecostals, the United Pentecostal Church. And they basically got rid of the Trinity. They said that there's only one God. And when in the Old Testament, he, he was the Father. And then he changed form in the New Testament, was the Son, and now he's the Holy Spirit. But it's all Jesus. So you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. T.D. Jakes was someone who was ordained in that denomination, although in recent years he has said he no longer holds that, that wrong view of the Trinity. Well, what happened here is this. Most of the people that embraced this Pentecostal experience, the emotions, the, the tongues, and all of that, uh, well, well, let me read to you a firsthand description of what happened at Azusa Street. And, you, and, and this began to be replicated all over. A visitor to Azusa Street during the three years that the revival continued would have met scenes that just were beyond description. Men and women would shout, weep, dance, fall into trances, speak and sing in tongues, and interpret the messages into English. In true Quaker fashion, anyone who felt moved by the Spirit would preach or sing. There was no robed choir, no hymnals, no order of service, but there was an abundance of religious enthusiasm. In the middle of it all was... Elder Seymour, who rarely preached and much of the time kept his head covered in an empty shoebox behind the pulpit. At times he'd be seen walking through the crowds with five and ten dollar bills sticking out of his hip pockets, which people crammed there unnoticed by him. 
At other times, he would preach by hurling defiance at anyone who would not accept his views or by encouraging seekers at the wood plank altars to let the tongues come forth. And so that was the kind of work that went, began to spread. But if, if I could find, I struggle with how to express this. But almost all of the Pentecostal churches found their locations among the poor people in a, in a city. We used to call that the other side of the tracks. So you basically had Pentecostal churches that were popping up among those who were not middle class or upper class. And, and so that was where they were. So what was happening is the mainline churches like the Baptist and the Methodist and the Presbyterians heard about the strange goings on on the other side of the track. But they would never have gone there and walked in to, to see what was going on for themselves. So when it jumped the tracks, it moved from being Pentecostal to charismatic. So how did it jump the tracks? There's going to be a man that I'll mention more than once today. I think the main man responsible for the Pentecostal movement moving into the mainstream was Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts did something in the 1950s that allowed people who weren't from that part of town to see what was going on. He televised his healing meetings. So all of a sudden, you could be in the safety of your living room, turn on your TV, and there was Oral and he's, they're, they're, he's preaching, they're singing with enthusiasm, they're watching as he lays hands on people and, and they're healed. And, and, and so people began to say, what is this? Maybe this is something worth looking into. By the way, in the 1970s, his editor of his magazine, where they did the reporting of the healing testimonies, actually did an unauthorized biography. It was not completely negative or moral, but he said that he was the one that would interview people afterwards. He said he could find very few true verifiable healings and to, no, to oral's credit he prayed for everyone but he actually had two tents he had one tent for the very sick and there were no cameras in there and he prayed for them and he had another tent where the cameras were and that would be people that there could be more likely a result seen that could be put on the broadcast but he prayed for everyone but it, this editor gave one example of the power of his personality. He said that a man came up there and he said, and Oral said, what, is your, what do you need? He says, I can't, my eyes have gotten so bad, I can't even read the Bible anymore. Now you've got to understand they had TV lights on them. Oral took his glasses, threw it on the ground, stomped on it, broke his glasses, and handed him in the bright TV lights a giant print Bible and said, I want you to read this. And in that extra light with giant print, the man read the Bible and everybody broke out in applause. We have just witnessed a healing. But that night when he went home, he couldn't find his way in his own house because his glasses had been shattered. One of Oral's biggest desires, he grew up as a son of a Pentecostal preacher. He had been a Pentecostal preacher himself was he wanted to be respected like mainstream pastors. He would one day leave the Pentecostal church and become ordained in the Methodist church as a part of that. He founded a college so that those who were Pentecostals, charismatics, could have an education, so Oral Roberts University. But one thing that he did that really brought this into churches like Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, he encouraged a friend of his named Dima Shakarian to form something called the Full Gospel Businessman's Fellowship. And what they would do is they would have their meetings in, in nice hotel meeting rooms. So you're not going to the, the church down on the other side of town. You're going into a hotel. And you have businessmen with their suits on. And they would get up there and they would give the testimony of how they were living defeated lives. And all of a sudden they got this wonderful experience and their lives had been changed. And so the folks who would feel more comfortable going there than they would in a, a Pentecostal church began to come to that. Uh, also, there were several things that were happening at this time. This is in the late 60s, early 70s. There was an Episcopal priest named Dennis Bennett who wrote about his testimony of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. It was a book called 9 O'Clock in the Morning because that's when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But he, he gave this incredible story of how he, as an Episcopal priest, experienced this. Well, people were saying, did you just hear the word Episcopal priest speaking in tongues? This is really going far beyond just those emotional churches that are on the other side of town. But another great thing that happened that 
exposed people who were not a part of the Pentecostal movement initially to this whole experience of baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues was a man that in Opelika we were in cooperation with. He founded Times Square Church and we jointly oversaw some drug and rehab uh, places. Good man, loves the Lord. I'll give you some stuff on him later on. But David Wilkerson was a country Pentecostal preacher. And he felt God tell him to go to New York City and reach the gangs for Christ. And he wrote about his experience in a page-turning book called The Cross and the Switchblade. And later on, Pat Boone would be David Wilkerson in a movie. And Eric Estrada from Chips would be Nicky Cruz, the main gang member. And it's a, it's a great read. I just promise you, it's a great read. But at the end of the book, after Nicky's gotten saved, he sends him out to a camp to get him away from the city to disciple him. And all of a sudden, the book explains how Nicky Gumbel received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, sp and spoke in tongues. Now, you've got Baptists and Methodists reading this exciting book, and all of a sudden they come there, and they say, what happened there? And the legitimacy of this experience began to be sought and talked about in churches beyond the Pentecostal churches. Before I go any further, let me just give you an evaluation of the strengths of the Pentecostal movement and the weaknesses of the Pentecostal movement before we look at changes that have happened in more recent times. I would say one of the great strengths of the Pentecostal movement is their passion. When you're there and you love the Lord and you show it, I think that is wonderful. When I grew up in Baptist churches, we were so afraid that somebody might become Pentecostal that we sang in the holy mumble. You know, if, if you get too loud, you may have to go across the, the town and go find one of those churches. And, and so we were so afraid of, 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 of that fanaticism. But the same people who were afraid of expressing emotion in church were on Saturdays filling the stands of football games, acting like nuts, reading, rooting for teams. So I think that, that making it where the, the prejudice against passion uh, came through. Another thing that the Pentecostal charismatic movements brought to us was praise-oriented music instead of proclamation music. Much of our hymns that we used to sing were where we'd give testimony to each other or, or share our testimony. The blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Well, you're, you're giving a testimony, not speaking to God. Then all of a sudden you have new praise courses like, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. So there was this whole birth of praise music. A third thing that the Pentecostal charismatic movement has done positive to, positively is they have exposed us to parts of the Bible that we have ignored. Francis Chan, a few years ago, wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. He's not Pentecostal. wrote a book called The Forgotten God. He said, because in many evangelical churches, no one speaks about the Holy Spirit. I grew up in the Baptist church. Uh, didn't hear anything about the Holy Spirit because we just didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. Then when the charismatic movement came up, we sure weren't going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I could have come to the conclusion as a young boy being raised in a Baptist church that the Holy Trinity was actually Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Because those were the three things we talked about. Never talked about the Holy Spirit. Another thing that they brought that I think has been a strength is praying specifically instead of bless them in general prayers. They actually prayed for people to be healed. They didn't just call out, we've got these people in the hospital, Lord bless them. They were praying for them to be healed. Now, we always prayed for those who were in the hospital, but if anybody ever got really healed, it could split the church. And so, so I appreciate those kind of emphases. But let me tell you what I see as the weaknesses of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. In the movement, there's a real reliance on emotions and especially on getting an emotional high. We had in the 90s a church down in Pensacola, an Assembly of God church that had what was called a revival. And I had fruitless students and even folks from our church here that were making trips regularly to go and experience this revival. I talked to one of my fruitless students and I said, why are you going there? He said, because I know God is there. Because when I went to the meetings, I felt God. I knew God was there because I felt him. So I tried to gently say, now, now let me explain something. According to the word of God, according to the promise of God, God is there. If you're a Christian, whether or not you feel him or not, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And there's that, that need to have that kind of high. A second drawback of the Pentecostal charismatic movement is a lack of depth 
in the Word. What Pentecostals have done through the years and even today with the new emphasis that I'll talk about is they have a constant repeating in their churches of a few pet themes and a few pet verses. You don't find verse-by-verse verse teaching of the Bible in those churches. So they, there's a wonderful working up of emotional high, and then you hear the same themes over and over again. And what I began to see happening, especially around the 90s, I began to see many folks come into the churches that I served from the charismatic movement. And when I would ask them, knowing where they came from, they would say, we came here because we were starving for the Word. They were drawn by the verse-by-verse verse teaching of the Word of God. But another great drawback of the Pentecostal charismatic movement is they were always, they still are, always looking for something new. You've had this, or you've got to have, what else is out there? And they're always looking for new experiences. And oftentimes, these are experiences that you won't find in the Bible. For instance, one of the things that Benny Hinn is known for is something called being slain in the spirit. Now, he doesn't. He, he slays them in the spirit. He'll swing his coat or blow on people and they'll fall over. And that's supposed to be a new manifestation of the work of God. Well, folks, when I went to the scriptures and checked it out, the only people slain in the spirit were Ananias and Sapphira. And they didn't get back up because they were literally slain by the spirit. So you look at things like that. For instance... Uh, I heard about in the 90s what was supposed to be a great revival going on in Toronto. Holy laughter was one of their new experiences, new expressions of the work of the Spirit of God. So I got on a plane and went up there for three days and, and walked around and, and observed and, and saw what was going on. Uh, I did see sincere worship of God, but I saw people who were shaking uncontrollably. Remember, it says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, but self-control. I saw people who were laughing and could not stop laughing, and that was supposed to be a sign of the Holy Spirit, but it was even more than that. We had people that would come down and bark like dogs or roar like lions, and all these were the new manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Can I share with you clearly what the Bible says is the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? It is not shaking or holy laughter or tongues. The evidence that a person is filled with the Holy Spirit is Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. It's Christ-like character. It's not how high you jump. It's how holy you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. But one other thing that I've seen through the years, well, a couple more things. The whole concept of a one-time experience that lifts you to spiritual heights, I believe, is a typical American shortcut to blessing. 1972 was my first time to have a charismatic come and try to bring me over the line to him. He said, I can tell you love Jesus. I can tell you're so sincere. But there's something that if you'll get it, the Bible will become alive. You'll no longer be fighting with sins that you're fighting with. You'll have such power in your witness that people will just come to Christ right now. With this one experience, you'll be lifted up in one moment up to this high spiritual plane. Well, folks, we don't find that in the Bible. To me, that reminds me of the commercials I see on TV in America, how to lose weight without diet or exercise. <laughs> you can't do it. And, and the sanctification, growing in Christ, takes time and doing the spiritual disciplines in the power of the Holy Spirit, but takes time in doing the spiritual disciplines. But one other thing that has been so sad to me, when I was there in Toronto, they kept saying to people who would come up there, don't you want everything that God has for you? That man in 1972 that came up to me said, don't you want everything God has for you? And it's all, I want my blessings. I want what God has for me. It's all so self-centered. I want what's coming to me. And because of that emphasis to get all that God has for you, there has been a change that I think is so sad in the Pentecostal charismatic movement. They have moved away from talking about tongues and healing and those things because the Pentecostal charismatic movement has almost been captured by a new movement called the prosperity gospel. Let me give you an example of this. July 24th, 2022, an article in the New York, New York Post. I'll read it to you. A flashy Brooklyn pastor known for wearing designer outfits and extravagant jewelry says he was robbed along with his wife of more than $1 million while he was preaching at church Sunday. 
The police say they received a report that three people entered the Leaders of Tomorrow Church Sunday with firearms and removed the jewelry that Pastor Lamore Miller Whitehood, Whitehead, who goes by Bishop and his wife, were wearing. So in other words, at that moment in church, this husband and wife pastor team had a million worth, dollars worth of jewels on them at that moment. I can't hardly imagine a million dollars worth of jewel at any moment. But they were wearing that to church, and somebody robbed them. Uh, how did we get to the prosperity gospel? Well, my friends, there's a name that I'm going to bring up again. His name is Oral Roberts. When he began his TV ministry, he, was, he, he became a master at getting people to give. And he developed a concept in 1947 called the Blessing Pact. And he would literally promise that every dollar you give to his ministry, you will get $7 more back from God from unexpected sources. But in the 1970s, he came up with a concept that has now become almost the only thing you hear on TBN with some of these preachers. It's called Seed Faith Giving. And that what you do is you sow a seed by giving money and then God will take that as a seed of faith and will, incredible blessings will come towards you. And so if you hear from people today like uh, Mike Murdoch and uh, Creflo Dollar, that's all you hear. Give your seed and great blessings will come to you. And by the way, he experienced great financial blessings. He lived in opulence. His ex-daughter-in-law, Patty Roberts, Richard's first wife, described the family luxuries in a tell-all book called Ashes to Gold in 1983. She talked about their lifestyle. Um, Oral one Christmas gave Richard a Mercedes for Christmas, gave her a Jaguar for Christmas. They wore Italian suits, had Palm Beach, beach, beach vacations. She said, we lived like characters in a novel or a made-for-TV movie about the beautiful people, and I reveled in it. One other factor that happened in the early 1970s, a man named Kenneth Hagen formed a school to teach what he called the word of faith concept. It's become known as the name it and claim it teaching. And they basically say that if you speak it, God has to do it. So if you need money, you speak money and it has to come to you because you're telling. That's, that's, so that's their whole basis. The, the most popular person in that genre now is Kenneth Copeland. And he's big on teaching that. He recently asked people to give him money for his third jet. He already had two, but he needed a third one. And he was asking that, he says, I'm asking, I'm trusting God, that God is going to send my way this, this, this jet for my ministry. Can I give you some outrageous statements that have been said by some of the prosperity gospels? Years ago, there was a prosperity gospel preacher named Reverend Ike. And Reverend Ike said this, the love of money is not the root of all evil, the lack of money is the root of all evil. Creflo Dollar said this. Some people came to me and, and come to me and say, well, I came here to get some peace, not money. And I tell them, you need money, otherwise you ain't going to get no peace. Some people say it's about peace, joy, and love. No, it's about money. And one of the worst of all is Robert Tilton. He said, being poor is a sin when God promised prosperity. New house, new car. That's chicken feed. That's nothing compared to what God wants to do for you. And a milder version. I don't want to put him completely in this group because he does mention the fact that we will have to go through trials and such as that. But Joel Osteen is a milder version of this prosperity type preaching. Here's a quote from him. If you are struggling financially, then you've not got the victory. But let me say this. There are many Pentecostal leaders who are condemning this prosperity gospel. Michael Brown. Uh, David Wilkerson was a strong person who condemned the prosperity gospel. Let me read you a quote from David Wilkerson. Someone sent me a videotape of a convention sponsored by a well-known prosperity preacher. I was so appalled by what was being taught, I could hardly contain myself. It was blasphemy. One preacher boasted, I just spent $15,000 for a dog. The ring on my finger cost me $32,000. I live in an 8,000 square foot, but I'm going to build a bigger one, one Solomon would be proud of. When the people in my town see my big house and my Rolls Royce in the driveway, they know there's a God in heaven. And then Wilkerson added this comment. I wanted to weep because the entire time he spoke, people were running on stage and stuffing money into his pockets.
And what the prosperity preachers have done is they've taken just a handful of scriptures out of context, but there's one main one that only works if you use the King James Version. It's 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And so they say, well, if your soul's prospering, then you'll prosper in all things financially. Well, folks, look at the Bible. Look at the experience. Paul talked about the fact that I know what it's like to be hungry, and I know what it's like to be full. I know what it's like to be in need. I know what it's like to, to have all, all my needs met. There's no guarantee of that. But look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a man say he's going to build a bigger house than an 8,000 square foot house. Jesus told someone who wanted to follow him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air has, have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And can I tell you something very sad? It's not just America, but the fastest growing brand of Christianity in South America and Africa is the prosperity gospel. All, all, more than half of those who would attend church any given day in South America or in Africa are sitting under pastors who are giving them these pro promises of wealth in this life and that breaks my heart. Well your discussion question today at the end of this lecture is this. Discuss the pros and cons of how the Pentecostal movement has affected the churches in your area, and then even more personally, have encounters with them affected your life? Thank you.